Hey everyone, uh, I am delighted to be here tonight. Uh, and I wanted to give a big shout out and a thank you to the organizers, mostly self-organizers from the sounds of it. Uh, and of course, Alona for inviting me. Uh, a terrible fact, Alona has been, ch she saw me talk in December in Toronto and we discussed me doing a talk and she chased me a couple of times and I am traveling enough and busy enough these days that uh, it wasn't until I think you asked me what in April, and then I didn't get you an abstract or a bio until May, maybe late May, late night. Uh, I also wrote my premise and abstract while I was on the road and very tired and jet lagged in a different time zone. So, the title of tonight's topic, or talk, which you've already seen, is uh, designing or government: a new frontier for design. I'm going to be getting into that in some strange ways, but uh, it's pretty exciting. And I, I was actually going to talk about the Banting Invest Room, so. You beat me to that, but it's, it's great to be in Toronto. Uh, a little bit of history for those of you who are new to me and haven't seen me talk, uh, and just because, hey, it's my talk and I get to talk about it. I really love Toronto, uh, and I'm not saying that as someone who was born and raised here. I was actually born in Western Canada, in Alberta, and I moved to Toronto uh, to start my career. And a quick side note on that, I know you're thinking, well, this guy's probably like six or seven years into his career. Uh, I am deceptively youthful looking. I'm actually a lot older than you think. Uh, this is my 20, 20th year of being a design practitioner. And yes, there's some shocked faces closer to 40 than you think it's next year. So with that in mind, knowing that uh, I'm not just some you know 20 year old kid here to talk to you about UX, I'm actually a practitioner. I've been doing this for a while. But I had a little bit of a detour at the beginning of my career. I started off in a research lab in Western Canada in Edmonton, Canada Research Chair position and doing some incredible stuff around open source content management systems in PHP, MySQL. I'm hoping these are familiar terms. We also were experimenting with this brand new technology called CSS. I think that's pretty well known. I heard a snigger there, so that means like, yeah, that gives you a sense of like my OG design chops. Uh, I came to Toronto thinking, you know what? The big city will be doing it differently. They're gonna be miles ahead of me. And instead, no one knew what I was talking about when I was talking about CSS and style sheets and separating your visual layer and your presentation layer from your content layer. And so I fell into advertising. But that was sort of a good thing because it allowed me to contribute in some tiny way to the fabric of Toronto. It really helped me feel like Toronto was my own. So I got to work on Roy Thompson Hall and Massey Hall for a couple of years. I got to see some great shows there and I was still doing digital things in addition to this sort of like more traditional advertising. I got to work on the Film Fest for a few years. Uh, this is incredible from, for a kid who is like from Western Canada. Like, Film Fest is glamorous and exciting and the city just changes overnight. Uh, fun fact, this year, which was 2005, where you see the hands, the Midnight Madness poster that year featured a zombie arm pushing out of the ground and that was actually my arm that we photographed and had as a claw. So I'm immortalized in that respect. But I also got to do neat stuff. I worked on the Canadian Opera Company account and was doing a lot of digital stuff for them, a lot of website and visual design for the website, some interaction design. But um, this was before the Four Seasons Performing Center, before the Opera House existed. And so I built this incredibly complex, ornate gala invitation. The outside was felt, like soft felt, with silver foil stamping. There was a logo, a logo embossed not only there, but also like into the felt itself. So there was texture. And when you opened it up, it was this pop-up of the Opera House inviting 300 of Toronto's finest to this gala event. Uh, it's foil stamped, very, very difficult to produce. And needless to say, I did not get any for my portfolio. Uh, I wasn't invited, so I just took a photo and that's all I have. But these little things helped me contribute to the sense of being a part of Toronto. And I'd always felt like there was an interesting disconnect because I'd done this technology work and I was here I was doing really traditional print work. Important skills as a designer gives you an appreciation of the medium, but also a complete separation from what I'd known before. And I was still doing some digital work and I got to do more and more digital work, but it was all in the advertising context and none of it was what I'd really learnt in the research labs. So as things happen, uh, 2007, I'm like, you know what, I need a change. And my partner and I, we jump ship and we move all the way to London, England. 
spontaneously. No jobs, no place to live because life should be an adventure. So fuck it, why not, right? Uh, arriving in 2007 in London as we are on the brink of the largest recession that our generation and the generations before and after us have ever known. Maybe not the best of idea, but I landed on my feet because I landed right back into technology. The Silicon Valley of London, England is referred to as Silicon Roundabout because it's around a traffic circle and there are incredible startups there. Uh, I ended up working on things like the Internet of Things before we were calling it Internet of Things. I fell into startups, I was doing consulting. It was just like leave, li uh, pardon me, living and breathing technology all over again. Uh, this was actually the view from one of my offices uh, after a few years. It's like, you don't get much more London than this. You've got Big Ben, the Shard, the London Eye. Uh, there's the Houses of Parliament on the right, and you've got Westminster Cathedral. Like, this is London as you know it. And I'd worked in startups, and I'd uh, done some really interesting stuff. Like I said, we figured out a way to make printing presses, uh, accept digital files so people could print their own newspapers. Uh, that was really exciting, and I worked with a startup called Last FM that had done some interesting things in that space. Um, but it's all sort of like progressing along, and then I finally end up leading design at Expedia, which is, I'm assuming people in the room have heard of Expedia. It's the world lar world's largest travel company. There's 10,000 full-time employees worldwide. Then there's two, 3,000 contractors in addition to that. So this is design at an entirely different scale. This is massive, and I think, all right, all the stuff I've learned, all this continuous integration, continuous deployment, this agile, like Expedia is going to be just killing it. Well, in a beast of that size, 10,000 people worldwide, things slow down a little bit, but uh, that's not a bad thing. Uh, at this time, there's some really interesting stuff happening in the United Kingdom. Uh, there are some civic tech movements, people who are looking to try and make their city better through technology and the application of it. and. I end up taking a role as the head of design at the Ministry of Justice. And I'm going to come back to all these points, so you'll hear more about digital government tonight. I guarantee it. And there I was working on projects, and I was at the forefront of the digital government movement. And now, now after 10 years in the United Kingdom, I've come back to Canada. I came back last summer, uh, and I'm the chief of design for the Canadian Digital Service. This is a new initiative from the Government of Canada, and we have a simple but ambitious mandate, and it's this, to deliver simple, easy to use services for all Canadians. I'll get into that later. I promise I'm gonna come back to these things. I'm gonna tie all the knots up, but let's keep going. So there we go, government, a new frontier for design. And before we really talk about government and digital government and what that all means, I wanna take a step back and acknowledge something. It's that right now, we are poised at a unique and fascinating phase of the technological revolution. Augmented reality, virtual reality, these are gonna change how we interact with people. Imagine wearing a pair of glasses that gives you important and intimate details of the person you're talking to. And based on their body language, you know that that person is feeling a little bit anxious and that they're not feeling convinced by what you're saying. You're able to change your tone, your, the timbre of your words. Imagine virtual reality settings where you're able to create your own avatar, and I know this has been done to death in the media. Ready Player One just came out, and uh, we've had so much sci-fi about this, but imagine conducting meetings in virtual reality. How are we gonna design for those experiences and really think about them? We're also at a point where it's like cryptocurrencies are everywhere, like, good Lord, we've had Bitcoin, we've had Dogecoin, Dogecoin and countless other ones. We've had people who created cryptocurrencies just as a lark and then ran off with all the money. Like, it's a bit wild west on some of these new technologies. And like that's, if one more person comes up to me and tells me about the applications of blockchain, I think I'm just gonna have to laugh in their face because these are interesting things, but we don't have commercial applications yet. And we'll get there. And even if we do have commercial applications, how do we apply those to the good of society? And that's a little bit about what I'm talking tonight is Designers, we're uniquely positioned right now. Um, and I'm gonna get to that in a second because I wanna talk obviously about some of the big ones. You've all read the news, I don't need to talk and I don't need to pick on Facebook. There's so much to say here, it's like the millions and millions of bots and fake accounts that exist. Uh, 
Facebook has outed gay users before they were ready to come out. Uh, the entire Cambridge Analytics scandal. Uh, tell me if these are resonating with you. Uh, okay, great. Um, the entire thing where they're undermining democracy as we know it, by accident. A great example of how when you construct a new system, when you develop something, when you design something, there could be unintended consequences. Uh, and this is to say nothing of the fact that when you install Messenger on your phone and Facebook on your phone, it mines your contacts, it listens to your phone calls, and it's constantly building data about you. Uh, we could also talk about Twitter for a second, because I'm going to try and be fair and pick on everyone if I'm going to pick on anyone. Uh, it's this massive, incredible platform. There are moments when it brings me sheer joy, but it's also a huge platform for neo-Nazis. I'm not calling them the alt-right, I'm calling them neo-Nazis. I'm taking a stand here. If there's also extreme viewpoints on there, uh, if there's trolls. Jack of Twitter, he just doesn't seem to want to address this. And Mike Montero, for those of you who know him and have read his works, he's really taken Twitter to task. He's loud, he's angry, he's vibrant, and he's very black and white, but I think his voice is an important one. And I think he's asking really tough questions about design and ethics. And I mean, there's millions and millions and millions of bot accounts on Twitter. Not fun bots like the ones that put like a llama or a funny GIF in your stream, but like the bot accounts that are just there to monetize and create a false sense of followers to create, you know, social media stars. And then of course there's the filter bubble effect with all of these social products. I try and get out of my filter bubble regularly. I try and break out of the stream. I'll go and check out Donald Trump's tweets and then I'll try and find his followers and then I'll look at their tweets and then I'll look at some other, one, other replies to those tweets and then suddenly I'm on a white supremacist website and I'm like, oh, I really should not have done this at work. I'm certainly on an RCMP list now. Uh, and also sometimes I you know, click the link and it's like, this site is blocked because it's a hate website. And I'm like, oh good, at least our firewalls are doing something right. Twitter makes me just think we need a slider like this because some days I access my stream and it's just like the worst, just horrible things. And I'm like, really? Can I just like drag that over to the other side? Like, just give me the love and the warmth. Tell me about the amazing, wonderful things. And there's all these other features that like just drive me crazy where I'm like, you show me things that people I follow have liked that are intimate and personal. Like, you know, my friend has cancer or my friend has just had a child. That's like, you liked that, but I don't need to know that because I don't need these people. It's not relevant to me. Um, and it's really, I just, I want Twitter to do that sometimes. Get rid of the show me things my friends have liked. Show me more raccoon gifs. And if any of you follow me on Twitter, that's a thing I try and do at least weekly. I will go and find a raccoon video. I will trim out the best bits and I will put that raccoon gif into the world. I told you, I love Toronto and Toronto is the city of raccoons. So here we go. Uh, and yeah, let's talk about LinkedIn as well. Uh, it's probably the least bad of the bunch. I say that, but there are also all sorts of dark patterns and dark UI that they're using. They will try and get you to consent to accessing your contacts and your email system because they want to create that network of people you might know, which is why sometimes people on LinkedIn, they say, sure, I'll sign up, yeah, have access to my Gmail, and they end up spamming all the 2,000 people they have in their Gmail accounts. And they end up being recommended that they connect with their therapist on LinkedIn. And it's just like, oh, these are unintended consequences and none of these things are good. All that's, it's creepy to me. And also, just for a second, like I feel like LinkedIn is the biggest pyramid scheme going. Like it's the perfect Ponzi where a recruiter was like, yeah, you gotta get on LinkedIn. If you get on LinkedIn, I'll get you jobs. And you're like, oh, well, I mean, I'm kind of unemployed right now. I guess, yeah, I'll get on there. And then suddenly people are like, oh, you're on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. We should get on LinkedIn. And then suddenly it's like, has anyone seen that the New York Times decided, sorry, the New Yorker decided that one of those captions that could just be applied to any one of the New Yorker cartoons, Frank Camaro, another designer, put this forward. It's like, hello, I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. It's like, it could be two dogs talking and that caption is relevant. And it's like, that's how pervasive LinkedIn is. That's how pervasive their messaging is because we've spammed everyone we know with it. So, okay. The reality is though, these incredible products, it means that Silicon Valley, they're gonna change the world. This is just massive, it's incredible. But like, really? Really? I don't buy it. And it's like, a great example is if you search around on Twitter, it's like, every other week it's like, 
That's a bus. You invented a bus because Lyft has announced a new service where they're going to pick up multiple people and then stop at designated places. But it's then it's like Elon Musk also said, oh yeah, we're going to do a thing. Cars will come to a designated point. It's like, that. well, that's a bus stop, right? And like all humor on the hot side, here's Uber doing it with Travis back in the day. It's like, we'll pick one person up and we'll drop them off. We'll pick up another person. It's like, okay, right, right. Silicon Valley maybe has a slightly narrow view. None of this is actual civic benefit. This is private sector. This is a profit model. And I'm not hating on the profit model. The profit model is important and we have a capitalist society and it's how we continue. But I am saying like, you know, if you're surrounded in an echo chamber of people who look like you, talk like you, think like you, you're gonna be like, yeah, it'd be awesome if this car service also picked up other people, but only if you wanted that. It's like, well, if you wanted that, you could just take a bus or a streetcar or the TTC. And I think Jeff Hammerbach, or Hammerbacher, I'm not sure how to say that, said it best. You know, he riffs on this classic quote, and yeah, it resonates with me. And it resonated with me at a time when I was thinking about the applications of design, what I'd done with my life, all the digital work, all the ad work, and I was like, huh, this is a really good point. We should be figuring out better photovoltaic solar energy. We should be figuring out better ways to create safer environments. We should be reclaiming our roads from cars. All these things take time, but it's sad that our best people are drawn to Silicon Valley to work on these things. And that brings me back to what I said earlier, which is right now, as it stands, it's so good to be a designer. It's so good to be someone who works in the technology space, in computer human interaction, like right now, the market has never wanted you more than it has right now. Companies around the globe understand that design, technologists, creative technologists, whatever you call yourself, add value. And for the private sector, value is one of those incredibly important things. It means, well, if we take these people, we improve our bottom line, we improve our profits, and that means our shareholders become wealthier, which means that we get wealthier. We're increasing the GDP, and it's like, right, of course, that's an important thing. But if we leave the corporate view aside for a second and we take a more human view, when I say that designers, technologists, computer hint, human, ugh, computer human interactionists, that's a real word now, I just made it, um, add value, what I mean is that we think that there's a way for us to actually contribute in a positive way and to improve things. And that's exciting to me because it means that right now, with that technological revolution, with these new ideas coming forward, Technology is at a point where we have the potential to tackle some of the biggest problems that society faces. We can design for good. We can use technology for good. And it's not autonomous vehicles. It's not, you know, self-driving cars. It's not smart cities where we're tracking everyone's movements. I mean, maybe some of those places, but there's real good to be done. I like to make a joke that, yeah, design, technology, we're totally gonna save the world right after rock and roll does. And I wish I could take credit for the saying, Eric Speakerman, who is an incredible German typographer, for those of you who are big font nerds in the house, anyone? All right, wrong audience, that's why. Uh, he printed this up, he's an incredible designer, he's done amazing stuff, and uh, his point was like, yeah, so many people have talked about trying to save the world. It's not gonna happen. We've all gotta have a concerted effort. It's not like just one aspect can do it. Everything has to do it. So I think right now, in order to affect change, that new frontier I'm talking about, there's no better place than government. I genuinely believe this, and I'm gonna talk about why. And I was talking earlier about digital government, and digital government is one of those terms that gets a lot of uh, use these days. If you're paying attention to the civic tech scenes, you've heard this before. And people are like, oh yeah, digital government, you're gonna come in, you're gonna make it really easy, you're gonna like take all those paper forms and digitize them. And I'm like, well, no, not really. Digital government isn't about digitizing paper forms. There's always gonna be a need for paper. What if you don't have access to the internet? What if you're in a remote area? You still need a paper form sometimes. We have to be inclusive about this. For me, digital government is about a government that works at the speed of a digital society. So there's great change in the world. Things happen really quickly. A digital government should respond as quickly. We should be agile. We should be doing things differently. We should be trying to adapt and work for our citizens. 
And the Minister Scott Bryson, who runs Treasury Board, of which the Canadian Digital Service, which I lead design at, is a part of, Minister Bryson has this great quote that he's trotted out a couple times. It's definitely his soundbite, so bear with me for a second as I butcher it. He said, uh, we can no longer be a blockbuster government in a Netflix age. And I think it says a lot about his intention and his desire. And the thing is, this digital government, it's not a new idea. In 2006, Canada was a world leader in government, in digital government. We were far and ahead of the pack. The UN recognized us and said, wow, Canada, you're doing a hell of a job. And then we did something that is beautifully Canadian. We got shy of the spotlight. We stepped aside and we said, oh, you know, we're, we're really good, but uh, no, it's fine. And we sat on our hands. We sat on our hands. We took ourselves out of the game. We benched ourselves, to use the hockey term, for 12 years. We just sat back. We let the rest of the world come in. Now, granted, we had changes in administration. Priorities changed. Yeah, that's always going to happen. But we were doing awesome, great stuff. And then we just let the world pass us by. And instead, the leader in digital government is now the United Kingdom, GDS, the Government Digital Service. They come about in 2009, but they really get going in 2011. So we stopped in 2006, 2009 GDS is coming together, 2011 they really hit steam. We had a head start and we sat for five years before someone else even really got going. But GDS was an incredible thing and they had the simple mandate of trying to make government services better for everyone. Simple, easy to use, human-centered and user-centered. And GDS, I mean, the success there and some of the work that I did there informed other digital services around the world. The United States, because they're bigger and better and you know everything's great in America, they have 18F and because, like I said, they're bigger and better in the US, you get two for the price of one. They also have the US Digital Service. And for those of you who are aware of the US Digital Service. This was an initiative started by Obama. He brought the US Digital Service and formed it by bringing people from Silicon Valley to come in and help fix healthcare.gov and the Obamacare program, really, to make sure that the website didn't fall over when people tried to access it. But there's also incredible work happening around the globe. Estonia, Estonia is a world leader in digital government now. It's a tiny little country. They've been swallowed up and become independent twice now, I think. Um, but recently, becoming independent in the 90s, they were able to institute some amazing things. Estonia has this rule where they can only ask someone for their information once. And all the government departments have to sort it out between them. They have to share that information. Right now in Canada, you want a driver's license? All right, send us your details. You want a health care card? Okay, send us your details again. And that's the provincial level. At the federal level, you want a passport? Sure, cool, send us your details. You want a tax return? Cool, send us your details again and again and again. And Estonia just said, no, we'll ask once. We'll do the hard work to make it simple. And doing the hard work to make it simple is what government is about, digital government is about. But here in Toronto, there's also a brand new initiative. I think they're a few years old. They started with Ontario.ca. And we have the Ontario Digital Service, headed up by Hillary Hartley. I love the Ontario Digital Service. They are amazing, great people. Uh, I work out of their offices when I'm in Toronto. They're a lovely bunch. They're hiring people like yourselves to try and make Ontario better and try and deliver services for Ontario in a better way. So that's my plug for the ODS. Great people, an amazing leader. Hillary Hartley, who's leading them, came from 18F in the US. She was a Presidential Innovation Fellow. She's probably gonna be upset that I'm talking about her and talking her up, but she's lovely and she'll give you a big hug, so. but. There's also stuff happening at the Civic level, like Civic Tech Toronto. Does anyone here go to Civic Tech Toronto? Okay, two, three. Yeah, this is great. There's stuff happening. People want to make their cities better, and they're like, cool, we can do it. Give us the data. We'll work with it. Of course, I'm making it sound amazing that like these digital services are doing great work, and they are, but working in government is, well, it's not without its challenges. It's incredibly hard and difficult. And because I'm a designer, and I'm going to speak particularly about design here, often I talk about being a designer in government and what that means, and people are like, really, designer in government? Don't you mean like the lack of design in government? And uh, you would be forgiven for thinking there are not designers in government because, well, sometimes it looks like there isn't. 
The interfaces are difficult, accessing the websites are hard, the websites don't have a consistent look and feel. Uh, you can get things done better in the private sector and on you know, other things than you can on the government websites. We're notoriously bad at that. Having said that, this is a little bit unfair and it's a little bit mean because there are designers in government. There are pockets of designers and researchers and technologists and HCI specialists or CHI for tonight. Um, and they're like little splinter cells scattered across government. Like if you get, get all those people and if you could put them together, you'd have a rebellion and then all you would need was just like a coordinated resistance. And I think that's like the plot of at least two Star Wars movies, maybe four or five, I don't know. But like, yeah, we're poised and we're ready. And uh, I think CDS, the Canadian Digital Service, we're getting better. We're trying, this is a new initiative, like I said. We wanna be that driving force. We wanna connect those pockets. We wanna find those allies and do better for you, for Canadians, to deliver better services for you. And the reality is, we don't care if at the end of the day, you know, the Canadian Revenue Agency says, yeah, we did everything amazing and they don't mention us. There's no limit to the work you can get done if you don't care who takes credit for it. And we live by those words. Public service, it's about serving you, the people. We're not in it for the glory. We're not in it for the money. Believe me, we're not in it for the money. Um, we're doing it because we think there's a better way. And it's nice because now we're seeing interest from people who've worked in the private sector. We're seeing civic tech movements thinking, well, yeah, we're doing it here in Toronto, but what if we did it for all of Canada? And design as it stands in government is kind of a narrow thing. When I say I'm a designer in government, most people think, oh, oh, right, like graphic design and like posters and brochures. And I'm like, well, no, not that at all. And they're like, I'm like, well, I'm sort of like more of an experienced designer or a UX designer. They're like, oh, right, UX, totally, I get it. Like totally usability testing, right? And I'm like, well, no, I'm not doing just like time on site and goal completion and analytics and trying to figure out if people got from point A to point B. I'm not running A-B tests. Uh, it's bigger than that, but this is how design is understood in governments, how the application of technology is often understood as well. And there certainly isn't any human-centered design or user-centered design, call it what you will. Once in a while, we'll find a client experience branch somewhere in government. We'll find a group who are doing some good work. They're doing research, understanding things about users, and they're like, yeah, our clients are definitely doing a thing. Uh, clients come to us for our passport. Here's where clients have problems. And I'm just gonna take a moment. That word client bugs me so much. Um, client experience, no. It's because they're users, they're not clients, they're people. There are no clients in government. You don't get to choose, you know what? Of the service providers available to me for taxes, I'm gonna choose government. It's not like you can go and get your, like this is not a reality. Don's Discount Passport Warehouse, the best prices in town. Like, you can't get your passport from anyone else. This guy doesn't exist. You have to get your passport through the government. You have to pay your taxes through the government. And if the service is shitty, if it sucks, if you don't hear back, if you don't know where your passport is, well, too bad. You only have to use the government. That's your only recourse. And yeah, you can call the government. But I'm sure you've read the news stories about how call centers are overwhelmed, how internal problems mean that they're just not taking calls anymore. Like they just stopped taking calls for a bit. The CRA was just like, we just can't. So we're just gonna, no phones, please. And they just turned it off. Crazy, uh, absolutely maddening as well. And for me, users is the word I wanna use. And I wanna talk about user experience in government. And when I say a user, I don't just mean you, the people, or me trying to get a passport. I'm talking about every user. I'm talking about the front office staff, the back office staff, the call center staff, the people who work in the local area offices, the person who says, hey, what are you here for today? Oh, you need a passport? Okay, it's that line. All of these people make up the experience. All of them are users in this service. So, all right, I talked about CDS. We're this brand new government department. We're putting user-centered design and technology at the heart of what we do. Our goal is to partner with other government departments and try and improve things, make things better, deliver services better. We're tackling these problems, these big ugly problems, with, well, what we call service design. Has anyone here heard that term before? It's getting very popular. Uh, 
There are lots of definitions. There are lots of cute videos you can watch about how service design for a coffee shop, like this, versus service design for this. I'm gonna just say service design, importantly for me, is about the design of services. It's about how we actually get, deliver a passport for all of the users that I mentioned, not just the person who's receiving it. It's about making sure all the conditions are in place for success to allow these people to do their jobs. And because the government of Canada is the largest service provider in Canada, the challenges are large. They're really massive. And so we need to think about service design not as just like beautiful recommendations on how you can improve your experience, but like, okay, here's some recommendations and here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're actually building. And I think that's an important distinction right now because service design is still amorphous here in North America. Oh yeah, it's about recommendations and ideas. And I'm like, no, fuck it. Service design is about delivery. If you're not making a thing, if you're not actually delivering that thing, if you're not testing it and putting it in front of the people who are gonna use it, you're doing it wrong. And I'm sure that'll get me in trouble, but I'm gonna live by those words and die by them. So what we're doing for service design is we take design and we take designers and researchers and designers could be interaction designers, visual designers, service designers, uh, it could be content designers, people whose job is it to think about the exact words on the page. I'll give you examples later. We pair them with researchers, psychologists, anthropologists, ethnographers, and we say, all right, go and understand the problem. Fall in love with the problem. Don't look for solutions, because this is the other problem in government. The technology departments in government are like, cool, we'll add a pull-down menu. And we're like, oh, no. Pull-down menus have so many problems. They're mobility issues. They're terrible. And just no stop. You cannot keep just bolting features on to these massive software projects. That's how you end up with critical failures. So we say go and fall in love with the problem. Really understand what all of those users, the staff, the people on the street, what they need. And then we're gonna pair you with some developers, hardcore programmers, people who work in open source programming languages, modern programming languages. Go, bring them on the journey, help them define the feasibility, understand it, if we add it to government, hopefully we end up with a result that is better for Canadians. And I say hopefully, but I've done this before. I did it in the United Kingdom with the Ministry of Justice. We deliver transformational services. I know it's possible. And that's why I'm excited to be doing this here in Canada. Nothing like coming home. And a home turf advantage, right? Or sorry, home ice advantage. See, I gotta get the hockey metaphors back in me, slowly but surely. But the challenge for us aside from the fact that we're working government and it's a huge, massive organization that we have to slowly push against. And we have to go and talk about what research is and why we're doing things differently and how when you do things that are different, it's difficult. If I say, look, throw away your old process, come on a new journey, we're gonna build a small thing that's gonna cost you a 10th of the price, we're gonna try it out, test it. Well, people get a little bit disconcerted. They're like, ooh, we'd just really like you to go away, and come back and give us something that doesn't work and then we'll deal with it later. <laughs> they don't actually say that, but it feels like that, God. Okay, so the challenges are that we have to be inclusive. We have to be accessible. This is for everyone. We have to span coast to coast. In Canada, like the old joke is that Canada is a country with too much geography. Well, it's true and I feel it these days because I need to work on things that work at the 49th parallel all the way to the 60th and further north. If I'm gonna design something, if I'm gonna design a web application or a service, I need to work for you in Toronto with your fancy smartphones and your excellent 4G networks and your high-speed internet. But I also need to design it for the family who live three hours north of Yellowknife who don't have a reliable Wi-Fi connection. They may only have satellite internet once in a while and they may have 3G, but their smartphone might be 10 years out of date. They might be on an iPhone 4. They might be on a Blackberry. Those are still a real thing. Uh, and if we're trying to serve up something for them, we need to make sure that we're sending it down the pipes to them in the smallest and most efficient manner so that they have an excellent user experience. We can't just design for you. We can't design for the metro areas. We need to design for everyone because this is where we work, genuinely. I mean, this is the Yukon and it's a national park, so we don't actually have an office there. Uh, the Wi-Fi probably wouldn't be that great, but it tells you, like, that's the scope. That's the challenge. You think it's easy to deliver a web application? It is. You think it's easy to deliver a web application to someone, a park ranger who lives here and needs to submit his timesheets? Ooh, that's fun. That's interesting. That's tricky. That's hard. But that's why we call it work and not happy fun time. 
I go to work every day. So what are we doing? Well, we're doing a lot of myth busting. Uh, government, technology, people who've been in government a long time, for them it's like, they've been hearing this word agile. Have you all heard this word agile? It's a very, very cool word. I just heard about this word, it's very exciting to me. No, so I've been agile since, <laughs> I've been always agile. No, um, I have been working in an agile fashion in technology, in the tech industry where it means very certain things since 2007. And I have these meetings sometimes in government where I'm sitting with a bunch of senior executives. They're like, oh, well, yeah, we're definitely going to be start doing more agile work. And I'm like, tell me about this agile work. It's going to be great. And they're like, well, uh, yeah, so uh, it's definitely a lot better than the process we have now. Agile is definitely better than now. And uh, we're, we're using a lot of sticky notes and post-its. We're writing down our problems and we're putting them up and we can, then we can, we, we can see all of our problems. And I'm like, okay, good, good. Uh, we also do stand-up meetings. You know, we all stand up for our meetings. That's good. Yeah, that's very agile. Oh, and uh, uh, we're doing these things called sprints. Uh, we took 52 weeks of the year and we broke them into two-week chunks. So, yeah, we are sprinting and we are agile. And I'm just like, okay, all right. There's a lot of work to be done here. Some of that is, no, I just no, none of that. No, just like, let's start again. For me, agile is that classic idea of you build a small thing. You get it out the door right away. You test it with the people who are gonna use it. You find your problems and then you build on new things. You fix the problems and you release that. And you do that again and again and again until you're dizzy from looping and until you're just like, oh man, I wish I could work on something else. But you can't because you need to do it for every Canadian. So in government, it's more like, well, fragile or even agile fall. I've seen a lot of that and it's just like, okay, right. So. We're doing the myth busting. We're talking about what actual agile looks like. We're also doing a lot of capacity building, trying to make sure that tech teams understand that we're not the enemy, that when we apply human-centered design to their thinking, it's actually better for them. You don't have to build 10 more things. We're gonna build one tiny thing that addresses all of those user needs. You don't need to build proprietary software just for the call center staff. We can find a way to address this. And that's exciting. Uh, because we're taking a service design approach, it also means that we're working collaboratively with our partners. We're bringing them on the journey with us. We do a lot of workshops and co-creation sessions. One of our partners is Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. For the rest of this presentation, I will just call them IRCC. And they're the Immigration and Refugees and Citizenship people, but it's a mouthful. So IRCC really interesting project because we're dealing with some stuff around becoming a citizen. Very quickly, is there anyone in this room who has become a Canadian citizen? Okay, great. Uh, I had the option of becoming a Canadian uh, citizen of the United Kingdom, and I did. And I went through a long drawn out process where I had no transparency. I had no idea what was happening. I just knew that I would send the government some money and most of my documents and most of my personal life and my passport and then something. Something, sometime, possibly. And then you get a letter. Let me talk a little bit about what it's like to become a Canadian citizen. You have to do a couple of things. You have to prove your proficiency in one of our two official languages, French or English. You also need to write a test about becoming a citizen. Do you know who the Prime Minister is? Do you know what some of the Canadian values are? And I've done this in Britain as well, and the questions in Britain are crazy. It's things like, in the event that a magistrate is not available to hear your case, which of the following people could be specially appointed to deal with small misdemeanors? And I'm just like, well, it's clearly a specially appointed constable sworn in through a long process, but like, wow, when am I ever gonna need to know that? Am I ever getting arrested? And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. No magistrate for me. I would like a specially appointed constable. Bring them. No, so these tests are really interesting. Um, but here's the thing. Becoming a citizen is an incredibly emotional process. This is a big deal. Most people will do it once in their life, if at all. A lot of us are born with our citizenship. All of us are born with our citizenship, perhaps? I think there's an interesting Venn diagram there. Um, and when you become a citizen, like I said, it's an emotional process. It's stressful. 
And what happens is, one day, out of the blue, you get a letter from the government. You hold in your hands an envelope stamped with the Government of Canada logo, and you know it's from the government. You can tell. It's like a brown paper envelope. It's got the little plastic window. The little government branding is there, and you know it's about your citizenship. So put yourself in that person's shoes for a moment. You're new to the country. You've been building a life for yourself. You know you have to write a test. You've been studying. And then one day you get this letter you're not sure what it's gonna be about. And you open it, and you're nervous, and you're probably a little bit anxious. Like, the fate of your new life rests in this letter. And the first thing you see is this. All caps, notice to appear. It's terrifying. You, you like, oh God, for a verification of identity, oh, what did I do? Oh my God, I forgot to bring my criminal record, my criminal checks. I didn't, I didn't, oh God, what have I done? What, and people just, because they're in this heightened emotional state, because our users are worried and anxious, they panic. They may never get to and or to write a citizenship test. And it's all caps, and it's actually this angry, which is why I'm yelling at you, for effect and theatrical effect. People often get to that first and second line. They see that word identity documents, and they just, oh God. And they pick up the phone, and they call the call center. And they're just like, I just got a letter. They finally get through after, you know, being on hold for a while. I just got a letter. Okay, tell us about your letter. Can I get your file number? And then they go, okay, I'll identify myself. I'll go through the process. I'll go through the phone script with this person. Okay, so I just got this letter. Great. Um, yeah, I've seen you received a letter. What seems to be the problem? So I got this letter, but I sent everything to you, and it should be fine. Why isn't it fine? No, no, no. It, uh, uh, it is fine. Uh, the letter is around your citizenship test. We'd like you to come and write it. What? We'd like you to come and write your citizenship test. Like, you, you're moving along. The process is continuing. Oh. 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 Okay, right? And we have this moment where suddenly our users are happy. But they've had to go through all of this, and they've had to go through the phone system. So, as a designer, as a service designer who's trying to think about the entire picture, I look at something like that, and I'm like, well, we probably don't have to be all caps. We probably don't have to yell. We could probably make this a little bit nicer. And our content designer, he and I sit down and we talk. And I'm like, okay, come on. This, this has got to be easy. Like, I used to be in advertising. I've written some campaigns. I've directed TV commercials, for God's sakes. Like, we can do better. And so what we decide is, rather than do this, which is angry and yelly and scary, we'd do this. Congratulations. You've made it to the next step in your citizenship process. This just makes sense to me. Why weren't we doing this already? What happened? Like, why did we decide we need to yell at people and be so angry and formal? And don't get me wrong, the people who work in government, the people who let it get to the all caps, they've been doing this a long time. They are trying to do the best. People get into government to make a difference. It's just eventually the policy changes or their immediate manager changes. They're like, oh, you know what? We've got to make sure people actually show up to these things. Like, let's reward it. Let's make it seem sterner. And so they go down a path, but they don't think about the unintended consequences. See what I did there? I just looped this back. I'm going to do that again. Just wait. Um, yeah, so things get out of hand, and it's just like the bureaucracy gets in the way. But we know that we can prime the user. We can give them a better experience the moment they enter that, open that envelope, and then it means that we can address some of that emotional impact. But it's not enough to just tell the person, look, you should come and write a test. Because the government also says, you need to come and write your test on this day. It's like, well, what if that day doesn't work for you? Well, you can write a letter to the government and tell them why that day doesn't work for you. And you send that letter in the mail and you don't hear anything back. You genuinely don't hear anything back. Eventually, you'll get another letter that says you've been rescheduled for this day. You have to attend. But what if you've got like travel for business, or a holiday booked, or you're taking care of someone, or you're just ill, or some people, had, like we found one user was like, I would really, really like to come and write my citizenship test, but I, I have an MRI scheduled that day. Is it, is it okay if I change my citizenship test date? And for the staff members at IRCC, they're just like, yeah, no problem, because it's just a date for them. But for this person who's going through the citizenship process with all this gravitas, this emotion, this intense patriotic pride that's building them, this is a big deal. They don't want to just reschedule. They're, you know, we've had letters from people saying, 
I'm so sorry, but that's the day my daughter graduates. And I, I just, I would really like to be there for her. Is that okay? Of course it's okay. Do the things that make you feel like you're part of our society. Be part of Canada. Enjoy those things. You made it. Like, we want you to have a good life. Yes, you can reschedule. Absolutely reschedule. But we make it difficult. We say, you got to write us a letter. It's got to be formal. And people write these beautiful letters saying, dear sir and madam, I'm so sorry. I have all these things and I really regret having to bother you. We're like, okay, look, we're not done a good job of telling people how they should just write letters. Let's simplify this. And what if instead of writing us a letter, they could use a service to tell us that they needed to reschedule their test. And it looks a little bit like this. This is an alpha. So we've moved from a prototype stage. We tested, we've tested and tested and we've built and we've created this. This is one of our first products. This is something I'm very, very proud of and I know it's not perfect and I know we've got work to do. But we're doing some simple things here. We're saying you can use this service to tell us that you can't attend your citizenship test. Okay, well, I know what this is doing. We say you're gonna need some things before you get started, have your file number. And right now it says paper file number. And I'm like, we sent them an email saying that they've got a test. Some people get a letter in the mail. So it's a paper file number. Can we just call it file number? And we're currently working through the policy around whether or not we can call it a paper file number or a file number. We'll get there. And we also say, look, you need to tell us why you're rescheduling. But like, don't worry about it. Uh, you can read the guidelines and also importantly, when you do this, you're gonna select three new days as to when you could attend. We're not just gonna say, you'll get another letter in the future and we'll tell you when to show up. We're gonna let you have some choice. We're gonna empower our users. And then we say, look, when you send this, you're gonna cancel your old appointment, so you better have a reason. Okay, let's start the service. We click through. Well, tell us your full name. We originally said, our designer came up with something that was like, please tell us your first name and your last name. And we tested it and we realized that that's not fair. Full name and last name, first name, surname, these are a very Western construct. There are plenty of cultures where that is not a thing. And so we said, all right, we've listened to our users. We know that we should be asking for your full name. For someone who's grown up in a Western culture with first name, last name, I know what to type there. For someone from a culture where that's not the norm, they also know what to type there. Okay, great, we resolved a pain point. We listened to our users, we did the research, we tested, and we've evolved our technology. We made that change like that, right? Like we deployed it the same day, it was live that day. And our partners were like, oh my God, you just built a tech thing and then fixed it. Because sometimes in government, a bug gets into the system and they're like, oh man, we just released a thing and it has a bug. Cool, well we fixed the bug. Great, we fixed the bug. Cool, so we can't release it for three months. So we have to live with broken technology for three months because they have a release schedule, because they're not agile, because they're not running on Amazon Web Services, because they're not running in the cloud, and because they're not deploying 86 times a day or 10 times a day or whatever. And we are, and that's exciting for us, and that's why we think we're uniquely positioned. We also ask, what's that paper file number? But then we tell them, it's that number that's at the top of the email we send you. Oh God, paper, email, please, we'll, we'll fix this, I promise. And then we ask, why are you rescheduling? And these are the most common reasons. People are like, well, I'm traveling. I have medical things. We don't need to know what the medical thing is. That's not our business. Let's be private by default, you know? If this were a typical web service, people would be like, medical, and then like, tell us what the medical thing is. Like, no, we don't need to know. That's not important. We want you to have a sense of privacy here. Then we say, okay, well, citizenship tests, citizenship tests, at least for our alpha, we're doing a private alpha with a Vancouver area office. They happen on Tuesdays and Fridays. So here's a calendar. Please select three days you're available and make sure you keep those days free because we will try and schedule you on one of those three days. So you choose the 17th of July and it shows up there and you can remove the date if you need to, if you misclick. This works beautifully on mobile as well. It's fully accessible. So people with vision impairments, people who have mobility issues, they can access it too. Then we say, cool, here are all your details. Well, what are some of your reasons? Like, why don't you review this? So there's my name, my paper file number, my reason is medical, my explanation is, well, because medicine. Um, and we do a little bit of work around, okay, there's your availability, away we go. 
you hit the button that says send request, knowing that you're gonna cancel your appointment, and boom, a confirmation page. We tell our user, cool, we got that, we listened to you, thank you. This didn't happen before. You just sent something into the darkness, into the void, and it was like, I hope that worked, awkwardly. Uh, but now we say, look, here's what's gonna happen next. You will get another notice from your local IRCC office. They're gonna try and find you a date and a time that you suggested, and if you have any questions or concerns, here are contact details specific to your local office. Not the national center, not the call center, not like calling into somewhere in Montreal and having to be like, so I'm dealing with the Vancouver office and then we're rerouting you. This is just like, no, simple and easy. The nerdy exciting thing about this for me is that we built all of this without integrating with any of the big, ugly Java frameworks and massive, ugly systems that the government uses. We built it in a way that just uses email, actually. What we've done is when you send that request, we're just sending an email to the Vancouver local area office to a special email account. And it's someone's job to read those emails and be like, cool, this person needs to reschedule. Excitingly, the call center staff, who previously could only ever just leave a note on someone's file, their digital file, this person would like to reschedule which wouldn't be accessed until someone in the local area office was like, this person's test is coming due. So you can see how there's a conflict there. The call center staff can use this exact same service going through those exact same steps with someone they're speaking to on the phone and it gets delivered to the proper office as well. So we solved that user's pain point as well. The internal staff in the local area office, now they get an email. They don't have to deal with paper forms. They don't have to have all these other things, other processes. It's easier and better and we've addressed multiple user needs. But hey, we're not just doing it for immigration, we're doing it for our veterans as well. Veterans Affairs Canada, they deal with benefits for veterans. That's their primary service delivery. Now the thing about being a veteran is when you go to the website, you're like, cool, are you here for a disability award? And it's like, well, I, I haven't won anything. I don't understand why you're awarding me a disability. And that's an example of language and content again. Before, when we had all caps screaming at you that there was a notice to appear, now we use government jargon. We say, oh yes, you, uh, you're here for a disability award. But they're not. They're not here for a disability award. What they're actually here for is financial support for injuries or illness related to military service. I've never been on a veteran's website. If I came looking for a disability award, I must have known a lot about the system. If I come and I see something about financial support, that I can understand. That I say, oh, that's money for me to help me because I'm injured. And here's an interesting thing, and I hope you can all see this. We're developing a system based on research to allow veterans to understand what they're actually eligible for, what benefits might apply to them, what are relevant to them. So we say, look, do you need a pension for injuries or illnesses related to military service? Do you need that financial support? Above it, you'll see that we call this the disability pension. Here it's the disability award. Here's the rehabilitation services. Anyone in this room wanna take a wild guess what rehabilitation services are for veterans? Don't guess, it'll be embarrassing. I'll tell you, this is embarrassing for me. Rehabilitation services is what the government calls it when you stop serving in the RCMP or the armed forces. You will now be rehabilitated to join society as a normal, as a muggle, as a non-military person. We call it rehabilitation services. I mean, for Christ's sakes, Amy Winehouse's biggest hiss was like, try to make me go to rehab? Like, there is context, there is meaning, there is importance behind those words. And we're just throwing them around. Like, veterans don't need to be rehabilitated. They don't, like, if you've done your time, if you're healthy, if you're an individual who just needs a little bit of support to begin your new life, that's certainly not rehabilitation. Maybe we could call it transition or advice or guidance, and that's what we're doing. We still have to show these terrible service names so that people can, uh, I'm going to take questions at the end, so I'll come back to you. Sorry, I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Instead of rehabilitation services, we want to call it things like, you know, you'll pop it open and you'll say, okay, 
This might be important. Uh, you might need some of these other things. Or you might sort by, I'm looking to find a job. So rehabilitation services is now called personalized support to improve your health and find a new career. Well, that sounds a little nicer. That sounds a little bit more relevant to me. I'm not looking for rehabilitation. I have no problems. What I really do need is just access to a career counselor to help you find a new job. And you can see there that we're calling it career transition services. Part of rehabilitation, but we're breaking it out and trying to make it a little bit normal and human. This service that we're working on currently, that we're still very much testing as prototypes, we have a build in progress, but it's not open to the public and it's not even open in a private alpha yet. So we're not actually releasing it to veterans yet. You're seeing it for the first time. I probably should have cleared it with my team before we let it be videotaped. This is work in progress. We may find, and this is an important thing about being agile, that this doesn't suit our users properly. We may find that this is not the right thing to do, in which case we just throw it out. We get rid of it. We will never put that live if it's not the right thing. What we do has to be based in research. It has to solve multiple user needs. We know that the language used in the Veterans Affairs Department varies from department to department. Call center staff have a different idea than front line staff who have a different idea than the program managers or the policy directors. And so we're trying to unify that, create a single source of truth, and this product is part of that. All right, I've been going on a while now. What's next? What's next for CDS, the Canadian Digital Service? Well, more. We don't want to do it all. We are small, we are young, we are ambitious. We've only been around for 11 months. We were a budget line item in last year's budget. It took four months to really get things going. I joined the team in October from the Ministry of Justice and it's been full tilt ever since. I'm nine months into the job, I believe. And we have our birthday next month. We're delivering something for uh, immigration, refugees and citizenship Canada and we're excited, but we wanna do even more. We wanna do an end-to-end -end service, not just a thin slice, not just doing the test, what if we could do everything around immigration? What if we could do it for passports? In the United Kingdom, I can renew my passport from my smartphone. I go through the details. I get someone to take a photo of me with my smartphone. It uploads instantly. It gets checked by a machine to determine that, you know, oh, my eyes are open. Uh, my nose is in the right place. Cool. Uh, I say my nose is in the right place, not as a joke, but because we also had to teach the machine learning program that was doing the computer vision that some people have facial disfigurements. And what you do is you don't just reject the photo like, sorry, that's not a human, that's a terrible thing to say to someone. What you do is like, we're having a bit of trouble identifying you in this photo. This will be reviewed by a human, we'll get back to you. But you can still submit directly from your smartphone. Do I want that for Canada? Absolutely. Do I think we can do it? 100%. Do I know we can do it because we've done it before elsewhere? Yes. So I want to do it all. And my team, and the entire team at CDS, we believe this. We believe we can do it all because we're standing on the shoulders of those giants, 18F, GDS, the USDS. Other people have done it. We get to do it. We get to make new mistakes, not old mistakes. We want to fix things. There's this great quote from Ben Terrett. He was the design director in the early days of GDS in the UK. He said, no more innovation until everything works. And this goes back to my blockchain point. I've had a lot of people come to me like, look, we can solve citizenship with blockchain. And I'm like, fuck you. Like, come on. <laughs> you you want to bring new weird technology into something that's paper-based? Like, why don't we fix the paper? Why don't we fix the staff problems? And they're like, oh, but then we can't sell you blockchain for a lot of money. And I'm like, yeah, you can't. Because we're not going to waste your taxpayer dollars on garbage and bullshit and unnecessary technology. And I should have apologized at the beginning. I like to use profanity as spice to language. <laughs> if that offends you, I'm very sorry. I'll keep it clean from this point on. You can tell I get angry and passionate about things. We also have to build capacity in all of government because there is so much work to be done. And we were a leader back in 2006, like I said, but we've stagnated since then. Canada sat back and just let everyone else do things for 12 years. We sat back for an entire decade and a bit to just say, cool, we're not gonna do it. We've stagnated, we haven't done anything for 12 years, which means, frankly, no one else is coming. We didn't do anything for 12 years. We're finally doing something now. So, all right, now's the time. We have to do this. We need technologists, we need 
computer human interaction specialists. We need people like you because frankly, it's up to us. And because it's up to us, we can't do it alone. And frankly, the Canadian Digital Service, we need people like you. We need you. We need you to understand who we are. We need you to understand what we're doing. We need you to get excited about this. We need you to not accept bad government services. We need you to vote in favor of better things. We need you to get out of that Canadian mentality about like, oh, it's okay, we're sorry. And just be like, you know what, damn it, no. I won't accept this. I know things can be better and I want better. And I'm gonna demand it and I'm gonna vote for it. Because Canada needs you. We need the latest group of technologists. We need the comp sci specialists. We need the people who understand how to make machines talk to each other and how to make machines talk to humans. Right now, with tech being as it is, with the tech that we have in this amazing time, CDS being where we are, we're centrally located, we don't have a P&L, that means we don't have a profit and loss index, we, we're not cost recovery, we are free to work with any government department can work with us and we'll partner with them and we will try and bring all of our skills to bear if we think it's the right thing. If we think it reaches Canadians properly, if we think the scope is big enough, if we think the problems are big enough, if we think the ambition is big enough, we will happily work with any government department. That's true. This is the biggest opportunity for designers and technologists to make a change and to make a difference. And that, that is why I firmly believe that government is a new frontier for technology and design. So, thank you so much to our time. I really, really appreciate that you sat through what I think might have been close to an hour. Alone, had told me I could go for two, and I was like, whoa, no one wants two hours, believe me. I don't want to do two hours? Let's not do two hours. Um, that's me at the bottom. I'm the only Chris Govius on the internet. I have that clever distinction. That's my Twitter. But importantly, if you're thinking about what's going on, there we are. We are the Canadian Digital Service. We are at CDS underscore GC, digital.canada.ca. We are the Service Numérique Canadien. SNC underscore GC, numérique.canada.ca. Please come take a look at us. Read our blog posts, share, tell your friends, tell everyone, tell your parents we're trying to make a difference. Vote, do all the good things that civic-minded people do, but just get the word out because there's only one of me right now and I need everyone in Canada to know about us, to know that we can do things in a better, different way.